everyone, and good evening from Galilee, Israel. This is Amir Tsalfati, and I'm here back home from our family vacation. I took my family, in fact, part of the family. Uh, the two uh, older uh, children, um, my son is in the military and my daughter is in a pre-military um, course that, um, um, of course, takes her away from us for nearly three months. And so the, the, the two younger ones joined me and my wife, and we went to Croatia, and we had the time of our lives. It was such a blessing. Thank you for praying for me to have a good time with my family, with my children. We played so much, and you know what? We didn't have much time on the screen. We actually were, we took uh, some memory games and other things, and we played and spent some good quality time together, and it was so needed, so necessary. And it's almost like you rediscover your children when you have that much time together. So thank you for your prayers. Um, it was amazing. I'm back here. I'm refreshed. I know that in some parts of the world uh, there are some things going on right now. I do know that uh, there's quite a few major earthquakes starting from uh, around the ring of fire. Uh, but also we all know about uh, the... Um, um, hurricane that uh, was approaching Hawaii and thankfully uh, thanks thankfully prayers uh, were lifted and it was it went down to a category one and it's not as bad as um, they uh, predicted and I just spoke to JD pastor JD um, about an hour ago and everything is fine so far with them over there and thank you guys uh, for praying for Hawaii and uh, I believe that uh, God listen to the prayers of the saints. Um, so, um, quite a few people just a few days ago on my way back home from my vacation, uh, President Trump was giving a speech in Virginia and in his speech he said, Israel will pay higher price in peace talks after the embassy move. And uh, immediately I was flooded with messages and questions of concerned Christians asking me what is it what are you saying and immediately people started using the cards he's the Antichrist blah 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 so let me let me explain something it, it has to be very very clear this is what I call they circumcised the whole message of that speech President Trump started by saying that we moved the embassy to Jerusalem against all the, re the requests of the world leaders. I did it. I didn't answer their phones until after. And then he said, I, we believe that Jerusalem belongs to Israel and it had to be taken once and for all off the table. So what President Trump said is, Jerusalem is off the table. It's non-negotiable. We're not going to talk about Jerusalem's status. It's Israel's capital. Let's move on. Now, since Jerusalem is non-negotiable, obviously the Palestinians should expect something much greater than what they may have expected earlier because now, they, according to the rules of business, they deserve more. Well, what you don't understand is that there is not even a single living Palestinian on planet Earth that will agree to move an inch forward without Jerusalem being declared as their capital. You, you must understand, although Jerusalem has never been the capital of any other nation besides Israel, never, ever in the history of planet Earth, the ethos and this whole this whole um, illusion that it is the capital of the Palestinians was built up in the last 20, 30, 40 years in such a way that they went up in such a high tree they cannot find a ladder to get down from that tree. And I remember when everybody warned President Trump and the Israeli, uh, even the Israeli Prime Minister not to move the embassy to Jerusalem because it will create chaos and all hell will break loose and there will be bombings everywhere and thousands of people will die and nothing happened. Nothing happened. Ladies and gentlemen, not even a hiccup from the Arab world. 
the Arab Spring uh, that turned into an Islamic winter to, uh, cost the, the, the Arab world and Middle East such a great toll, and especially the Syrian war, that the Jerusalem thing, everybody knows it's not the capital of the Palestinians. Everybody knows that the Muslims, even though they controlled the Middle East for hundreds of years, they never had Jerusalem as their capital because it wasn't their capital to begin with. So it, they all know it, it was a political tool to somehow confront the state of Israel and to somehow be bring Israel to an end because if you take part of our capital, if you take the chunk of our, of our territory and if you get guns into the wrong people's hands, then eventually you kick the Jewish people out of here. That was the salami, we call it the salami um, um, way of doing things, little by little, and before you know it, a big chunk is gone. And so you have to understand that President Trump's policy is very consistent here. Not only that he is very proud of what he did, what he did with Jerusalem, every, every rally he goes to, he speaks of of the move of the embassy to Jerusalem. He's proud of it. He's very, he's boasting in it. And, and ju just so you, so you understand, yesterday, yesterday, um, the uh, State Department um, released a statement at the direction of President Trump, we have undertaken a review of U.S. assistance to the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and the Gaza to ensure these funds are spent in accordance with U.S. national interests and provide value for the U.S. taxpayer. As a result of the review at the direction of the President, we will redirect more than $200 million economic support funds originally planned for programs in the West Bank and Gaza, and those funds will now address high priority projects elsewhere. If anything, President Trump is cutting the budget and the aid and the assistance to the Palestinians because he knows all of the hundreds of the millions of the dollars that America is giving the Palestinians are actually going to the families, salaries for families of terrorists. And so um, we're not going to play those games. Um, ladies and gentlemen, remove from the table the thoughts and the fears that President Trump is going to divide Jerusalem or that President Trump is going to force Israel into a peace that will harm and endanger Israel. It's not going to happen. You have to understand the Christians voted him in and he of all people is committed to satisfy the evangelical Christians. And you, you, you know more than I do that the evangelical Christian stand is that Israel should not be divided and Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. It's very, very simple. So if the Palestinians will ever get any offer from President Trump, it will not include the right of return of, of all of those fake, refu of fake refugees. It will not include Jerusalem and it will not include them having any borders with other Arab countries. So you must understand we in Israel, the words of President Trump from a few days ago didn't even make big headlines more than one day. That's it. We moved on. Because we all understand everything President Trump say is fully coordinated with the Israeli Prime Minister because they are allies. He's not President Obama that will backstab um, Netanyahu. He's not going to backstab the Saudis. He's not going to backstab the Europeans. He is telling people to their face what he thinks is going to happen. Now, now, you have to understand, in the world of business, if you give one party something, then the other party expects to get something as well. And President Trump very, very soon will realize that the rules and the laws of business do not apply to the Middle East. Why? Because the Palestinians have never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. They will say no, no, and no. In fact, let me tell you something. Israel is the only reason the Palestinians don't kill each other. Why? Because there's the West Bank and there is Gaza here, and Israel is in between. And I want to tell you something. The people of the PLO in the West Bank hate the guts of Hamas in Gaza. And if it wasn't for Israel geographically, physically being between them, they would have massacred each other just as the Syrians are doing, just as all the others are doing in Iraq and in other places. 
this is such a hatred that none of you will ever, ever be able to understand. So you need to understand that what President Trump said was within the effort to lure the Palestinians back to the negotiations. But I can tell you one thing. If there is one thing that both the Hamas and the Fatah, the PLO, agree on, is that they will always say no to Trump. They don't talk to Trump. They don't talk to his... Uh, his team, President Trump, for them, is the most pro-Israeli and the worst thing that ever happened to them. They were spoiled by President Obama, and now the toys were taken back from their mouth, um, and they're very, very depressed. So, if anything, President Trump continues the pressure on the Palestinians financially, economically, um, to get back to the table of negotiations and to get back to reality. Jerusalem is not yours, and it's off the table. Refugees don't exist after one generation. You made it up. It doesn't, it, nowhere in the world, refugees are there for more than one generation. You made it blow up to, to millions of people, where today there's few thousands only. So what happened is, he says no to the refugees, the right of return of refugees, no to Jerusalem, no to, so what is it that he can ever give them? So he's rhetorically is telling them, yeah, I'm going to ask a high price from Israel. But in reality, what can he ask from Israel? Now, Netanyahu kept very quiet. And he actually said, we are not pushing the Americans. They can take their time in forming a peace deal. And in the meantime, Israel continues deepening the relationship with the moderate Sunni world all around us. And it's very interesting. Uh -huh. the minister, the, a Saudi minister to the Islamic affairs, Saleh bin Abed al-Aziz al-Sheikh, on Wednesday, three days ago, actually um, praised Israel and said, what really surprised us is the state of Israel, from what we know, did not forbid Muslim pilgrims to come to uh, the Hajj in Mecca uh, in, in, in Saudi Arabia. However, Qatar, one of the other Muslim countries, did forbid their Muslims from coming to Saudi Arabia. In other words, you see that the Arabs are so divided, they hate each other so much, and you can see that the Saudis are more and more talking highly about Israel. Now, don't, don't be fooled. I'm not sh I don't think they fall in love with us. But I do believe that, as Ezekiel describes, Sheba and Dedan will be on the side of Israel, may not assist Israel, but criticize those who come against Israel. So that is within uh, that which we understand in, in uh, Ezekiel. Now, I'm going to give you now three things that happened in the last two days that are highly or even crucial to the understanding of Ezekiel's war. And, and, and again, you, you must understand, for you it might be Ezekiel war. For us, it's the daily newspaper. It, it's amazing because uh, I will start with this, okay? It starts with that one, okay? The Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs of U, in the UK, in the Russian Embassy in the UK, released a tweet and said, before demanding withdrawal of Iran troops from Syria, Ambassador John Bolton should explain the legal grounds of U.S. military presence. John Bolton, the uh, Ambassador John Bolton, who is now the, the, the uh, National Security Advisor to Gen President Trump, he was in the Middle East, he came to visit us, and he basically says um, that uh, uh, it is a, an interest of all to have Iran out of Syria. And uh, the Russians realized, wait a minute, wait a minute. You expect us to kick the Iranians out. But you know that the spoils of war in Syria are actually the oil fields. And you, Americans, are helping the Kurds to control the oil fields on the eastern uh, banks of the Euphrates. So how about that? Before you ask us to remove the Iranians, what are you doing over there? Very interesting. Now the Russians are actually using 
um, the Iranians as a leverage to kick the Americans out so they can enjoy the spoils of war. Remember, spoils of war. It's the amazing thing. Another thing you want to know. As of yesterday, the Washington Institute, the WashingtonInstitute.org, you can find it, released an article written by an analyst who is an Israeli um, military person and basically they said that 2019 is going to be um, 2019 is going to be um, a major Middle East war 2019 major Middle East war and uh, I would like to um, I would like to tell you what they said. They said this. They call the article the Great Middle Eastern War of 2019 and they said far from simply replaying the 2006 Lebanon War, the next conflict on Israel's northern frontier will likely involve many more actors on multiple fronts. In other words, it's going to be from the north, but it's going to be many more factors. Ladies and gentlemen, it's not Ezekiel's uh, that I read from. It's the Washington Institute that is basically predicting a, they call it the Great Middle Eastern War of 2019. Very, very interesting. WashingtonInstitute.org, you can find that. It's right there. I also want to tell you another thing which I find very alarming, extremely alarming. Um, I can tell you that uh, I just read in the Russian news agency, they released it yesterday, TASS, it's the Russian Politics and Diplomacy, um, they said that the Russian lawmaker suggests deploying nuclear weapons in Syria to respond to US sanctions. And then they say that the US policy of putting pressure on Russia has crossed the red line and Moscow should think about an asymmetric response such as the deployment of its tactical nuclear weapons abroad. That said, a senior Russian lawmaker um, whose name is Vladimir Gutenev. Putin is preparing the ground for nu tactical nuclear weapon in Syria. Now remember, if you really read, um, if you really read Ezekiel's war, both 38 and 39, the description of that war is definitely there's a use of non-conventional weapon, and a tactical tactical nuclear weapon is definitely something that can be used if you read Ezekiel and the aftermath of the war and the burial of the weapon and the burial of, of the bodies and all of that, it's definitely speaking of that. So I'm, I'm just saying for the first time ever, the U.S.-Russian sanction ordeal is causing the Russians to threaten the U.S by putting a tactical nuclear weapon in Syria across the border from Israel. And you understand that if that tactical nuclear weapon will be directed towards us, uh, Israel will have to retaliate and Damascus might be destroyed. That could be a reason for that. Another thing that uh, is developing after um, Assad had completed the takeover of most of the Golan Heights on the Syrian side as well as the surroundings of the south and Damascus. Now they're moving to the last ditch of Idlib. Now what he usually do is he drops either barrels of explosives or he's using chlorine as a, as a biological or chemical weapon. Now you have to understand something. Ambassador John Bolton said while he was here that America is not going to sit and allow Assad to use a chemical weapon again. 
And chlorine is a chemical weapon. I don't know if you, you have to understand. It's not only sarin gas. Chlorine is, is as deadly. But also, you need to understand that look what the Russians just said. And if you understand Russian propaganda, you know why they said that. The Russians just said that they are... Um, okay. Elements in the Russian Ministry of Defense said that some elements in Syria are planning on a chemical attack in the country in order to criminalize President Assad as the one who did it. And they also want such a provocation, a provocative thing, to cause America and other allies to have a reason to hit Syria once again. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, we're going to see probably round two or round three when it comes to hitting Syria from outside because everybody is bracing for the last ditch of the rebels and, and, and that's Idlib and everybody knows the way Assad does things is first cause major, major chaos and massacre then they will give up and then you come in and clean it up that's what he did in so many other places such as Aleppo such as the south in Dara, such as the suburbs of Damascus, and that's what he's probably going to do again. And that's very, very sad to see that. Also, um, I want you um, to know that um, we are fully coordinated with the Americans on that issue, and we're going to see what's going to happen. We also uh, noticed that the the relations between Erdogan and President Trump aren't great right now. In fact, the Americans are thinking to take away from Turkey. The um, Turkey is part of the group of countries that are actually helping manufacturing the F-35. I don't know that if you know that, but the F-35 is not fully manufactured in America. And in Turkey, they make the engines. Um, and um, we are getting already signs that America is thinking about moving the uh, production of the engines to Israel. And, 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 if, and of course, the delivery of the F-35 to the hands of the Turkish Air Force was postponed, and uh, they don't have any more access to their F-35s. So it's very, very interesting how tension is rising. And all of that, why? Because Erdogan is a pride, prideful and, and very arrogant um, person who wants to show himself as the deliverer of the Muslim world, Sunni Muslim world. And one of the reasons, by the way, the Palestinians will never agree to any proposal of Trump is because Qatar and Iran and Turkey are pulling the strings behind the scenes and they will never allow the Palestinians to agree to anything coming from America. So you need to understand that there's a lot of elements within the area that will not let any of the peace deal that Trump will ever propose to be accepted. Uh, and in the meantime, Israel is blooming. Israel is, um, economy is blooming. And in not only Israel's, uh, the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ just broke records, all-time all records yesterday. Uh, President Trump's uh, policy is proved to be amazing, uh, the lowest unemployment ever, uh, and, and the stock market is, is rallying in, in an amazing way. And no wonder why President Trump said that if they are going to impeach me, the markets around the world will collapse. He, he said something that every analyst can tell you now today. Every, ever since President Trump was elected, the markets responded amazingly a lot of Americans are much wealthier today than they were before uh, Trump uh, came into office and it's simply because he does things right that's it it's not a big deal he understands where to cut he understands where where to invest he understands that big government are bad and high taxation is bad for growth and he's just doing the right thing in Israel, we also see that 
are we're, we keep growing, we keep investing in infrastructures. Soda Stream just uh, was sold to PepsiCo uh, for more than three billion dollars, with uh, the promise that they will keep the plant in Israel and even open another one to give jobs to many people in in this country. And we are enjoying the time that I called the calm before the storm. So we see that while the Israeli and even the American economies are blooming, we see that the Russian and the Turkish and the Iranian economies are collapsing. In fact, let me tell you, British Airways suspended its flights to Tehran following Air France and KLM and others. And uh, we see that the Iranian economy is, is really falling apart. And uh, the truck drivers in the city of Mashhad uh, started a strike. Um, we know that more and more um, protests are, are going on there. And uh, the sanctions are really felt over there. And the, uh, the uh, people understand it's the wrong priorities of the administration. The administration just unveiled their newest jet fighter. Um, do you think that's what the Iranians need? Another jet fighter? What they need is food. What they need is gasoline for their cars. What they need is, is to survive and not to become a superpower militarily. No one in the Middle East wants to see Iran destroyed. But a lot of countries in the Middle East are to be destroyed by Iran. So that's important that you guys understand that. So we covered quite a few things that uh, happened over the last uh, few days. I hope I calmed you down when it comes to what President Trump said regarding the peace deal with Israel. And uh, I would like also to, to tell you that um, as a ministry, I started now a new thing. The Lord put on my heart, there's a whole generation of the millennials that I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, but they cannot really concentrate in front of a of a screen to listen to a message longer than two to five minutes. So uh, disconnected from Behold Israel, we started a new Facebook page and a new Twitter account, new Instagram account, and a new uh, YouTube channel. And it's called Amir's Bible Bites. And we are releasing anything between one minute to three minutes mess, uh, bites from my messages. And their response is unbelievable. Thousands, tens of thousands of views for every message and this is a great evangelistic tool for you to not just watch but mostly to share a lot of non-believers are watching it and the reason why I detached it from behold Israel it's because there's a quite a few people who will not see anything that is related to Israel and so I'm getting there from the back door by calling it Amir's Bible uh, bites and of course, my messages, a lot of it is, is on Israel, and you will get it at some point. Um, so I want to encourage you, go to Amir's Bible Bites on Instagram, Facebook, and, and Twitter, and YouTube, and subscribe and share. This is the best way for you to share the message. I also challenge all of you to say uh, in front of the camera and to send it to us, to our Facebook page of Bible Bites, um, to say just what the prophet Isaiah in chapter 6 said to God, Hineni, here I am, Shlacheni, send me. Uh, say it in, 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 in Hebrew and in your own language. This whole video of the Hineni challenge, we're going to post it right now in the comment section. You can watch it and do it and send it to us. And we're going to create a collage and promote it so the whole world will see that there is a great generation of people that is going to turn this world upside down and say to the world, we are here to serve the Lord. Here we are. God, send us. I'd like to also conclude with a few verses from Isaiah 40. It's verses that we heard a message in our church today on. A, quite a lot of people write to me, and quite frankly, I understand them. They say, Amir, we're so weary. We're so tired. We can't wait for Jesus to come back. And, and you know what? That was also what Isaiah the prophet saw 
in the people of Israel at the eve of their um, their um, exile into Babylon. He knew that there's a, a very challenging times coming to the nation of Israel. And then he said to them, Have you not known, in chapter 40, verse 28, Have you not known, and have you not heard? He said, in other words, you've heard that, and you've known that. We, we've told you that, but let me remind you that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he is neither faint nor weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the weak. And to those who have no might, he increases strength. Ladies and gentlemen, and then he says, Even the youth shall faint and be weary. And the young men shall utterly fall. You understand? So many of us, when we get to 40, 45, 50, we think, oh, when I was young, I was, I, I was stronger. No. I want to tell you something. More and more young people today are on drugs because they can't handle reality. The, op the, uh, the, the whole um, opiate epitome, the people are, are on drugs right now, whether it's prescription or, or real drugs. Um, it's because they can't handle reality. They're too weak. We, we are, it doesn't matter if you're a youth, if you're young, the strength that we need to have today is from the Lord. And if you're not in the Word of God, and if you don't get that from the Lord, then you're going to start finding yourself addicted to drugs or to therapists. And I want to tell you another thing. I am to tell you that one of the analogies they gave today was that um, when you have a cell phone or a computer, they all need to be recharged at some point. But outside, your phone will never tell you. You will never see a phone and say, oh, that phone needs to be recharged. It looks perfect. But when you turn it on, when you look at the screen, it shows you that the battery is almost dead. So on the outside, a lot of people look like they're strong, they're, they have it all together. But in the inside, they really are running on empty. And I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says this. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like wings, with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. And it's very interesting in the Hebrew. Those who wait upon the Lord, the Bible says. The Bible says it's not renew their strength. In the Hebrew language, it says they will exchange the strength. It's no longer their strength is the strength of the Lord. That reminds me of what Jesus said in, in Matthew 11, verse 28 to, to 30, about, give me your yoke, and I will give you mine, which is easy. In other words, we, there has to be an exchange here. We have to not only wait upon the Lord, but also do the exchange. Okay, you take mine, I take yours. It's not just renew their strength. The Bible says here, Kovea Adonai, Yechalifu koach, change, exchange their strength. So when I am weak, that's when I am strong. We're, we're strong in Him. And, and of course, then we can run and we can walk and we will never grow weary and we will never faint. But it is important that you understand that in these last days, there are some very difficult things that are waiting around the corner for all of us. And if we lean on our own understanding and our own strength, we will never be able to do it or make it. So I encourage you to find your strength in the Word of God and in communion with God while in prayer and not elsewhere. Because the world will never give you that peace. Jesus said, I will give you peace, not what that the world gives do I give to you? It's going to give us the peace that surpasses all understanding. Peace I give to you. That's what he said. So if you want peace and if you want that strength, then rely on him. And, and these are the last days. This is the last hour which brings me to my book, The Last Hour, which thankfully is already sold uh, 
more than 15,000 copies. Um, and um, it is about the last hour. We are in the last hour. And as uh, the closer we approach to the end, the more we need to rely on his strength and not on ours. So I encourage you all to read Isaiah's words, to find the other parallel um, verses in, in, in the book of Psalms and in Matthew and other places. And just remember to lean on God and not on your own understanding and certainly not on your own strength. So thank you for listening to this update and let's finish it with the ironic blessing. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha Ya'er Adonai pana velecha v'yichuneka Isa Adonai pana velecha v'yasem lecha shalom May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine His face towards you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up His countenance towards you and give you peace. And may I add, give you strength. Re exchange yours with His. Renew your strength. And so you will walk and you will run and you will not faint or grow weary. Thank you. God bless you. We're going to update you next week. I will give this update from South Africa. And I will also, from there, update you about our September events. I'm going to be not only in South Africa, but I will be in California, in a few places, such as Calvary Chapel of Tustin, Calvary Chapel of Chino Hills, Calvary Chapel of East Anaheim. And then I will be in Idaho, in Coeur d'Alene, and then I will be in Minnesota at the Olive Tree Ministries um, Understanding the Times Conference together with Pastor J.D. Farag and Pastor Jack Hibbs and others as well. So thank you. God bless you. Shalom. I love you from Israel. And stay strong in the Lord and keep uh, your peace only coming from Him. Thank you and God bless you. And shalom from Galilee.